Hey everyone, welcome back to A Matter of Life and Maiden, the podcast of the beast. I am Joe Labriola, and I am flying solo again today. And today I just wanted to talk about my concert experience seeing Iron Maiden live. Matt and I just got back from seeing Maiden in Washington, D.C. on the Legacy of the Beast Tour 2022. We saw them in the Capital One Arena in Washington, D.C., and uh, it was a great set list, a completely different set than what we saw three years ago on the 2019 Legacy of the Beast tour. It's hard to believe that was three years ago, but it's true. But today's episode, I kind of just want to recap and give my personal experience of seeing all these concerts. It's kind of going to be a recap of the entire podcast in general, uh, just going back and rehashing things because I just been sitting around after seeing them with all this, you know, pent up joy and love, and I just want to express it here. So I figure, what what better platform than jump on the podcast here and just kind of go over some of the stuff that I loved and I still love about my own personal experience seeing Iron Maiden live and how it relates to my life in general, my life and Maiden as part of a matter of life and Maiden. Of the podcast of the beast matt talked about in episode zero of the podcast how him and i both got into maiden and that's kind of where we wanted to start and that was his idea to kind of start the podcast how did we get into maiden and if you go back and listen to that episode you'll 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 get an in-depth view but just to recap uh matt heard ronnie james dio's holy diver and uh, this was back in the early 2000s so we're talking about like 2004 somewhere around there 2004 2005 um him hearing that song and then looking for songs that were related to that song and this is back when napster and limewire and bear share those services were around um so everybody was using it at that time and it's before the whole all the lawsuits and things came out that said they were you know you shouldn't be using these kind of things uh, the song that Matt first heard that related to Holy Diver, uh, when he was, you know, doing his search and trying to get into this kind of music, was The Trooper by Iron Maiden. And he he was hooked after that. You know, he heard The Trooper and he just kept digging and digging and digging and eventually falling in love with their discography. Matt and I talked about this on several episodes in our love, but I can remember distinctly just him and I sitting around talking and just seeing him light up when he talked about a a particular song or a particular album. I can remember uh, we were at a King's Family restaurant um, in our local town, and we used to get chicken fingers and potato wedges. <laughs> they were like our favorite things. And we would just go work out together, Uh, run, lift weights, go get something to eat, and uh, he was sitting there, and he was on this um, Sign of the Cross kick, I mean, he really, really loved Sign of the Cross uh, at this point in time, and I had never heard it, because up to that point, I had kind of avoided the um, the Blaze Bailey era albums, I just chose not to really listen to them, and this was probably about 2007 or so, I would say, Uh, I had been on a high with a matter of life and death and I mean I was listening to that album non-stop every day over and over uh, my ringtone on my my old crappy track phone at the time was the Lord of Light ringtone uh, and it was the chorus part you know free your soul and let it fly give your life to the Lord of Light keep your secrets and rain on me all I see are mysteries and it would just keep repeating 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 that was my ringtone and I was on a really uh a really strong Bruce Dickinson and really a reunion kick. I, at this point in time, I was really heavy into Brave New World, really heavy into Dance of Death, and really heavy into A Matter of Life and Death. Um, and I had gone back and really dug into Number of the Beast. I was really digging that album, and actually the first two albums too, Killers and Iron Maiden. I was really, really heavily into those albums a lot. Um, and then around this time period, I started listening really heavily. Not that I didn't listen to Peace of Mind, Power Slave, Somewhere in Time, or Seventh Son. But I got into the the darker material first. Stuff that was kind of relatable to, 
a matter of life and death because it was such a strong, dark, atmospheric, powerful, progressive, heavy album. You know, up to that point, it was one of the heaviest albums that Iron Maiden had ever done, if not the heaviest. And I was really into that record. So when Matt brought up Sign on the Cross, I was hesitant at first, but then going and listening to it, you know, shortly after that, we listened to it together, and um, we listened to a lot of Blaze stuff, in particular the X Factor. That record really grew on me then thereafter. And it's funny, because as I mentioned previously at the beginning of this podcast episode, we just saw Legacy of the Beast, and they played Sign of the Cross on it. And another thing I wanted to kind of tie into that was Matt first hearing the Trooper um, from the Peace of Mind album, the Legacy of the Beast tour, especially the 2018 and 2019 set, I mean, it was a very Peace of Mind heavy set. I mean, Maiden usually plays 15, 16, 17 songs, somewhere around there, you know, give or take, um, and depending on the length of the songs that they play. But on those first two, those first two years of the tour, Legacy of the Beast, um, and if you look at the live record, uh, Knights of the Dead, uh, the Legacy of the Beast tour in Mexico City, the live record they released in um, 2020, it um, it has the same set that I'm talking about. And you can go through and listen to it, and there are four songs from Peace of Mind in the set. War Eagles There, Revelations, Flight of Icarus, and The Trooper. So it's a very peace of mind heavy set. So if you were to sit there and pick an album from the 80s that this set encapsulates, you know, the 2018 and 2019 Legacy set, it is peace of mind by far. The beauty of this Legacy set, even the 2022 set, is that they really tried to combine almost the Live at Dortmund from 83 with the Rock and Rio concert for a new genre of fans. Um, and even though it is based around this whole Legacy of the Beast mobile game, and it is based around these interlocking worlds that deal with war, religion, and then the afterlife, heaven and hell, it's awesome that they that they do that and convey that. Because outside of Live After Death, I mean, their second biggest live record is probably Rock and Rio. For them to give us Klansman and Sign of the Cross live, a new generation of fans. And I say that as a fan who never had the opportunity to see them in 2000, 2001, or 2002 when Brave New World came out and they did a Rock and Rio concert. Because I didn't become a fan until 2004, 2005. So I became a fan right after Dance of Death came out and right before Matter of Life and Death came out. And uh, so did Matt. And one of the first songs that I ever heard, the first song actually I ever heard from Maiden, was Flight of Icarus, because uh, Matt, knowing me for, at that point in time, 20-some years, um, or so, or 16, 17, not quite 20 years, but close, uh, knew that I loved Greek mythology and mythology in general, and he played me Flight of Icarus because it had to deal with the mythological story of Icarus and Daedalus. And I loved it instantly. But he also played me a lot of stuff from Brave New World, so... Peace of Mind and Brave New World coming together, and not so much Brave New World, but the Rock and Rio concert with Clansman and Sign of the Cross. In this set for Legacy of the Beast has just been immense. I mean, it's one of the greatest sets I've ever seen. Personally, um, if I'm sitting here and ranking the three concerts that I've seen, it, it's so hard. I think from a nostalgic standpoint, the 2019 and uh, 2018 shows were a bit more geared towards the 80s. In Maiden's defense, and this is why you see all the imagery with the 2022 Legacy of the Beast tour, you have Senjutsu Eddie from the Senjutsu album fighting Trooper Eddie from the Peace of Mind album. So it's almost like they're fighting over the set to see who dominates it. And the great thing is they're both Eddie, so neither one can win. And if you look at the set list and you look at the shirts... Uh, for the 2022 Legacy set. It's like they're both Eddie, so you're only going to kill yourself at the end, right? Um, and it's funny because when they modified the set, they had three songs from Senjutsu, Senjutsu, Stratego, and Writing on the Wall. And then they took out War Eagles there, so they left three songs from Peace of Mind on this. So it was an even keel. 
three piece of mind songs three senjutsu songs so both eddies won at the end of the day in terms of taking the set and then ten songs mixed in from um the trajectory and the course of their their catalog i know that i'm sitting here talking about these things i am so grateful to be a maiden fan uh they have gone above and beyond all expectations and have exceeded it and uh just some statistics you know if you look back at some of the tours even when i became a fan since the reunion the brave new world tour you know into into rock and rio and those things even if you look at the predecessor of that tour the ed hunter tour based on their old video game they only did like 35 shows for the ed hunter tour brave new world was an album tour and they did i think 90 shows scheduled and they played 80 some and that's where they were with that then after that tour uh they kind of did the give me ed till i'm dead which wasn't quite as many shows as the album tour then they did the dance of death tour and if you look at that it was kind of a a um a not a very grand scale tour though. i think they only scheduled 55 shows for that to play on those legs um those couple years they played that or that year they played that 2003 and 2004 then in 2005, they did the Eddie Rips Up the World Tour that was 45 shows, so a little less than the album. Then they did the Matter of Life and Death Tour. But again, in retrospect, that was only 60 scheduled shows. It wasn't really until somewhere back in time where they started really going all the way and hitting these home runs and doing like 90 to 100 shows. Every tour pretty much since then. 90 shows scheduled for somewhere back in time. In 2010, when they released the Final Frontier, they did 100 and uh, I believe 101 shows for that tour, um, and that got us uh, the En Vivo DVD. After that, they did Made in England. They did 100 and I think just 100 shows for that, just 100 shows. Then they did they did that for 2012, 2013, and 2014. Then in 2015, Bruce had his cancer struggle in his battle. They released Book of Souls with that in 2016 and 17 and that show for the longest time was the most shows they had ever done since somewhere in time it was like 150 some shows somewhere in time uh book of souls was 117 shows and after that with this legacy tour now in 2018 2019 and now 2022 um because 2020 and 2021 dates were canceled because of covid um and then the restrictions after they did 140 shows for the Legacy of the Beast tour as a whole. And that's the most they've done since 1986. The 150 some shows they did with the Somewhere in Time record on the Somewhere on Tour tour. So it's pretty crazy to see that their popularity now is, is, is damn near, I mean, up there with what they did in their heyday in the 80s. And um, it's fantastic. And I'm, I'm really looking forward to see what they do with the uh, future past tour and if they follow the model like they've done with the tours that i've seen them on whether that's somewhere back in time that was really uh, uh power slave heavy made in england which was seven sun heavy and then the legacy tour which was peace of mind heavy i'm saying they're probably going to play four or five songs from somewhere in time and four or five songs from some jutsu so we shall see what happens but I mean, let me start off by saying the first concert that I ever saw from Iron Maiden was somewhere back in time. I mean, what a what a great way to jump into Iron Maiden. And your first live show is literally their greatest live record ever, um, arguably, with Live After Death. And their greatest album ever, arguably, with Power Slave. What a killer first show. Uh, I get chills just thinking about how amazing that show was. And uh, to this day, as much as I love the legacy shows, um, because, you know, just sitting here thinking about all the concerts I've seen them on, they, they fluctuate back and forth pretty regularly. But for me, and, you know, there's a bias there, and there's a nostalgia there, it is because it's the first show I ever saw. 
And I talk about it on the podcast episode when we talk about Live After Death and Power Slave and our experience with it. It's almost like you put in the history DVD part two, Live After Death of Iron Maiden, and you watch the guys play Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner on that DVD. And then I was there seeing it live. And it was the exact same way they played it, you know, with Janik included. But, I mean, identical formation, identical to to the DVD, if not better, nowadays. And it's crazy to think that, but 24 years later, 23, 24 years later, it was a better performance. It was just not as classic as the original, but sound-wise, execution-wise, perfection-wise, I mean, it was just unbelievable and um, I'm just gonna go through the set right now and I'll put a graphic up here so you can see it the somewhere back in time tour I saw that tour with this exact same set on March 14th 2008 and then I said the exact same set on June 12th 2008 just uh, just shy of three months later um, it was aces high two minutes to midnight Revelations, The Trooper, Wasted Years, The Number of the Beast, Can I Play with Madness, Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner, Power Slave, Heaven Can Wait, Run of the Hills, Fear of the Dark, Iron Maiden, and then the encore was Moonchild, The Clairvoyant, and Hallowed Be Thy Name. Um, wow. <laughs> what an amazing first time seeing Iron Maiden. Uh, this classic band that I had just been into at that point in time for about four years. Um, three and a half, four years, and then actually getting the opportunity to see them on this, on this tour with these classic songs that they hadn't played in 20 some years. I mean, just unbelievable, unbelievable to see Rhyme Live. And to this day, it goes down in history as the best concert that I've ever been to in my entire life. Both of those, but you know, the one on March 14th, 2008 is very special to me. And I've said this many times, and Matt has echoed this too, in previous sentiments that we've made on the podcast. East Rutherford, New Jersey, Izod Arena, March 14th, 2008. The Flight 666 live album and DVD. The Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner performance is from that concert. Because, let me reiterate, they did one show for one song. So they would pick a show that they did and apply a song to it, and they did all 16 songs that way. So it wasn't the same venue the entire time on the Flight 666 DVD. They just picked their favorite performances from 16 different places. And it happens to be that the Rhyme of the Ancient Mary performance was the concert that we were at, and it was also my favorite song at that point in time. Because I wore out the Live After Death DVD... I was wearing out Power Slave, just anticipating going to see the show, and Rhyme became my favorite song around this time, and then when I saw it live, it just it's even more memorable and personal and special to me, but this set, to the to this day, as a set list, as a whole, um, it's, it's pretty hard to beat, um, probably still my personal favorite of all time. So they did the Somewhere Back in Time tour in 2008 and 2009, and then they released the Final Frontier album in August of 2010. However, they played a North American tour for the Final Frontier over the summer of 2010, before they actually officially released the record. So the only song that they played on this tour was El Dorado from the record Final Frontier. I was at that tour in back-to-back shows. July 14th, 2010, and July 15th, 2010. Now, as opposed to the 2011 set that is basically the En Vivo concert, uh, song for song, the 2010 leg of the tour was more of a reunion and post-reunion greatest hits tour from Songs from Brave New World, Dance of Death, A Matter of Life and Death, and then El Dorado from the album that they were about to release. So what they did is they kind of did like a 4-3-2-1. They did four songs from Brave New World, three songs from Dance of Death, two songs from Matter of Life and Death, 
and then one song from Final Frontier. So the four songs from Brave New World they played were Wicker Man, Ghost of the Navigator, Brave New World, and Blood Brothers. From Dance of Death, they played Wildest Dreams, No More Lies, and Dance of Doubt. From Matter of Life and Death, they played These Colors Don't Run, and The Reincarnation of Benjamin Brigg, and then, as I said, El Dorado. But this is the full set. The Wicker Man, Ghost of the Navigator, Wrath Child, El Dorado, Dance of Death, The Reincarnation of Benjamin Brigg, These Colors Don't Run, Blood Brothers, Wildest Dreams, No More Lies, Brave New World, Fear of the Dark, Iron Maiden, The Encore Was Number of the Beast, Hallowed Be Thy Name, and Running Free. A really great set. But me, as a strong proponent of the 80s stuff at this point in time, after having seen Somewhere Back in Time, and then becoming obsessed with the Power Slave album for the longest time, I love this set, but this was my brother, because he went with us. This was my brother's set. My brother is an aerospace engineer, and he loves outer space. The stage set was dressed up as a derelict space station. The artwork for the album cover is Alien Eddie on some kind of satellite or alien spaceship. Um, and Alien Eddie came out and played a guitar, which was awesome. And I failed to mention this about the Somewhere Back in Time tour, but it was great because I got to see my two favorite versions of Eddie ever. And that's Mummy Eddie, who came out just like the Live After Death performance. And then Cyborg Eddie was the walk-on Eddie for Somewhere Back in Time. So it was amazing to see that. And then my brother got his, his favorite iteration of Eddie with Alien Eddie and the Final Frontier. My brother is a huge, huge proponent of the Final Frontier. It's one of his favorite Maiden albums. And he loves Brave New World. So for him to see four songs from that record, I mean, he was just blown away. See, I wanted to see more from A Matter of Life and Death. Because like I said, I was obsessed with that record. And I missed out on the A Matter of Life and Death tour. So for me, I wanted to see more Amalad stuff. But the tour was awesome. Either way. So great. Loved it. Utterly enjoyable, fantastic tour. So they did that, like I said, 2010 and 2011. Then in Maiden England, again, this was kind of like them bringing back a classic album for the modern day audience and modern day fans. Instead of doing Live After Death, which was what Somewhere in Time was based off of, or excuse me, Somewhere Back in Time was based off of, with the um, Live After Death stage set, they did Made in England from their performance uh, of the Seventh Son live uh, video and DVD and concert. And it was amazing. And they did that for three years, uh, 2012, 2013, and 2014. The set for that was Moonchild, Can I Play With Madness, The Prisoner, Two Minutes to Midnight, Afraid to Shoot Strangers, The Trooper, Number of the Beast, Phantom of the Opera, Run to the Hills, Wasted Years, Seventh Son of a Seventh Son, The Clairvoyant, Fear of the Dark, Iron Maiden, and then the encore was Ace is High, The Evil That Men Do, and Running Free. Matt and I didn't think that the Somewhere Back in Time tour could be topped in terms of stage production, but when we saw Maiden England in 2012, I mean the production and the props and all the stuff that they had and the lighting, it was unbelievable. So many different variations of Eddie came out. The, the artwork where he's a scribe and there's two candles, one with the devil and one with the angel and he's writing with a cool pen and the uh, fortune teller bowl is in front of him with Eddie's face and they did a like life-size replica of that on that tour it was fantastic, they did the album cover where Eddie has something in his hand, he's floating above the ice that, they did a life-size a life-size model of that it was unbelievable the amount of different Eddies we got. And the walk-on Eddie for this one was a... <laughs> because it was a North American tour in 2012 for Made in England. It was a uh, George Armstrong Custer Eddie. Which was interesting, but really cool. We enjoyed it. It was great. It was, you know, Seventh Son. Out of all the 80s albums with Bruce, Seventh Son, I'm not saying... I, I love them all, but... Personally, it's not my favorite. You know, if I had to rank them, I would go Power Slave, Somewhere in Time, Peace of Mind, 
Number of the Beast, and then Seventh Son. Not that I dislike the record, but it's not my favorite. Um, I like those other ones more, but I do love Seventh Son. But this set was amazing, and the first time seeing The Prisoner was incredible. Afraid to Shoot Strangers, even though it was from the Fear of the Dark album, fit into the set perfectly. And then just seeing all of the songs from Seven Sun, the title track, Moonchild, Can I Play With Madness, The Clairvoyant, The Evil That Men Do, it was unbelievable. And they also played Phantom of the Opera, which, wow, it's the best song from the original album, the first album in my opinion, and Matt and I used to talk about this all the time, they should just make that a perennial song in the set list. It's so good. And I think it was actually on this tour. It might have been in 2014. But Bruce said, if you don't like this song, then you don't like Iron Maiden, the Phantom of the Opera. So, I mean, he even he is a fan, and he didn't even record this song with the band. It was Paul Diano on the original record. So, I love it. I wish they would play it all the time. But that was a highlight, definitely, of that show, uh, as well as all the other songs, like I mentioned, from Seven Son, and the inclusion of Afraid to Shoot Strangers and The Prisoner made that a hell of a show too definitely up there for me loved it and they closed with running free just like they did on the final frontier tour so that was that was cool to see running free twice but up to this point they had closed with hallowed be thy name arguably their best song i mean ron ancient manor i think is the best thing i've ever done but matt and i argue that those are their two best songs hallowed be thy name and rhyme them closing with that on somewhere back in time was phenomenal running free was kind of cool too it was great because bruce did play with the crowd and there was a lot of interaction but it just didn't have that same lasting power as the last song on the set for me as hallowed did um both times now i, I kind of want to talk about this because from 2008 to 2012 so in a four-year time frame roughly matt and i had seen maiden five times Five times. We saw them in March 2008, June 2008, July 2010, twice, and then June 2012. So in a little over four years, we saw them five times. Then there was a five-year gap where we didn't see Maiden at all. And that's partially because they were touring with, you know, Seven Son of a Seven Son, the Maiden England tour in the 2013 and 14, so those two years were gone. Twenty At the end of 2014, Bruce had his cancer. Book of Souls came out in 2015, and then they took time off for Bruce to recuperate, so that's three years. 2016, they started touring with Book of Souls, but they didn't play close enough for us to go see them. So that's another reason it took so long. But then we finally saw them in 2017 on the Book of Souls tour, and in my opinion... The 2017 set list is better than the 2016 set list. And the 2017 set list is what the Book of Souls live chapter videos and concert album are based off of, the live album. They played If Eternity Should Fail, Speed of Light, Wrathchild, Children of the Damned, Death or Glory, The Red and the Black, The Trooper, Power Slave, the Great Unknown, The Book of Souls, Fear of the Dark, Iron Maiden, and then, in my opinion, this encore is one of the greatest encores I've ever seen in terms of any Maiden concert. The encore was Number of the Beast, Blood Brothers, and then they closed with Wasted Years. I mean, that was a phenomenal set. Uh, the encore in itself, just the way they did it with the subtleness and the ambience, Looking back on it, <laughs> a complete 180 from what they were doing, you know, the past couple years with Legacy of the Beast, with all the flamboyance and extravagance and all the extra stuff, which was awesome. Don't get me wrong. But I love how this band changes it up. Uh, just so subtle. Like with Blood Brothers, they had like a bunch, it looked like a, uh, a night sky with a bunch of stars in it. And then with Wasted Years, they did like a bunch of green lighting that was beautiful. Um amazing you know as compared to the legacy of the beast with the tnt and all that stuff that they do but 
the Book of Souls stage set too was just, I mean, truly and honestly, a modern day power slave for the amount of production that they put into the stage set and the stage design. And Nico's drum set with all the gold hardware and the Mayan calendar on the front that was bloodstained and the gong in the back and everything. His legacy set is amazing too, but in terms of an actual album tour, it's probably the most ambitious album tour that they've done. Not a lot of stuff with Brave New World in terms of stage set production. Not too much with, I mean, Dance of Death, they had the Grim Reapers, they did have that. But not too much else. I mean, a very castle-esque setting, a gothic setting. With A Matter of Life and Death, they had the tank and, like, the battlefield setting. Uh, the warp wire and the and all those kinds of things. You know, like a, like a, a, a war ravaged Europe after World War II. That kind of look. Final Frontier was the derelict space station. But outside of that, I mean, the production itself, though, even even on those sets that I mentioned, they just weren't as as massive or ambitious as the Book of Souls. So when Book of Souls first came out, people were talking about it, and they were saying, oh, it's going to be the modern-day power slave. And in a lot of ways, that does hold true. You have a really big, nice, long red and the black on it, which is almost as long as around the Ancient Mariner. You have Bruce's penned Empire of the Clouds on the actual album. Two of the longest songs in the band's career ever. And, uh, I mean, it just goes to show you the ambition of the band. Their first double album, they played 117 shows on this tour. Since the reunion, out of all the album tours that they've promoted, not history tours, but album tours, it is the most tour dates and shows that they perform live of any album in the reunion. Even more so than Brave New World. They only played 80-some shows. They had 90 scheduled, and they played 81 or 82 shows, give or take. Because some got canceled, obviously. But Book of Souls is the highest with 117 shows. So it goes to show you this kind of ambition. Ambitious touring, ambitious stage set, ambitious production, an amazing set. It was phenomenal, like I said. And Matt and I saw that in June of 2017, June 3rd, 2017. Phenomenal show. Phenomenal show. One of the greatest. I mean, if I sit here and I rank, I go back and forth. But compared to the Final Frontier Tour, which, like I said, was actually more of a greatest hits reunion tour, it's hard for me to put the Final Frontier one that I saw twice above the book of souls it's just so special to me and another thing i want to say about that too though is the fact that i hadn't seen the band in five years either and they delivered i mean it was like hey look and i think a lot of things go into that you know a lot of things like uh everybody living their lives and realizing they're mortal uh bruce's cancer struggle the longest gap between albums for the band it was a three-year thing since the reunion, and then between A Matter of Life and Death to Final Frontier, it was four years, and then this is the first album it took five years to make. So, but they made up for it. I mean, they made up for the lost time. They made up for the time it took. They delivered. They gave fans what they wanted. Oh, and by the way, the Book of Souls tour was all Mayan Eddie, everything. Mayan Eddie backdrop for the Big Iron Maiden that comes out was the Mayan Eddie. Walk On Eddie was Mayan Eddie. Everything was about Mayan Eddie, and it was amazing. So yeah, totem poles with the band's faces in it, just like in the interior art of the um, album. Just uh, phenomenal. I, I could go on about that forever. Red and the Black was amazing. That that concert was amazing. Book of Souls tour was phenomenal tour. An, an amazing tour. Amazing album tour. Loved it. Then that brings us to Legacy of the Beast. And as I said, I saw them in 2019. I saw them on July 24th, 2019 and August 17th, 2019. Matt and I both saw them. Then, um, the set list, and this is the same one that's on the live record, Knights of the Dead in Mexico City, Legacy of the Beast, Ace is High, Where Eagles Dare, Two Minutes to Midnight, The Clan's Man, The Trooper, Revelations, For the Greater Good of God, The Wicker Man, Sign of the Cross, Flight of Icarus, Fear of the Dark, The Number of the Beast, Iron Maiden, The Encore Was the Evil That Men Do, Hallowed Be Thy Name, and Run to the Hills. 
So in terms of a complete set, it's probably, in my opinion, it's my second favorite history tour set after Somewhere Back in Time. I, I think the Legacy of the Beast tour and the Somewhere Back in Time tour are two of the greatest live concerts ever. There's a reason why Iron Maiden is considered to be one of the greatest live acts of all time, and they just keep going above and beyond. Somewhere Back in Time was, and is, my personal favorite, as I said before, concert ever. And um, the Flight 666 live album and DVD is a phenomenal record, and it's amazing. And I'm so happy that I get to be part of that with the East Rutherford, New Jersey show that is on that album. I was there part of that crowd immortalized forever but legacy of the beast it's definitely up there when matt and i got done seeing these shows in 2019 we said it's kind of like the bookends because we knew the guys were getting old and we were like you know what if we never see them again after this show damn what a great journey that was what a great sojourn for me anyway from 2008 until 2019 a little over a decade and if that would have been the end of their career right there, I, I would have been satisfied. As a fan who said the first time I saw Iron Maiden, they played Somewhere Back in Time. Somewhere Back in Time was the first set I ever saw. And the last set I ever saw was the Legacy of the Beast set. I mean, that's a pretty damn good way to go. I mean, like, hey, look, this is it. But they don't rest on their laurels. They continue. The production on that set was absolutely unbelievable. The um, the devil or demonic looking Eddie that comes up during Iron Maiden and uh, Number of the Beast and uh, Trooper Eddie comes out on stage and fights Bruce. Phenomenal. Phenomenal. Fights him on the Klansman. Fights him on the Trooper. Just an amazing show. The Legacy of the Beast show was absolutely phenomenal. And uh, the change-up for 2022, and like I said, Matt and I recently just got back from seeing them. Uh, we saw them on October 23rd, 2022, this year, not too long ago. Um, and the set for that was Senjutsu, Stratego, The Writing on the Wall, Revelations, Blood Brothers, Son of the Cross, Flight of Icarus, Fear of the Dark, Hallowed Be Thy Name, The Number of the Beast, Iron Maiden, and then the Encore, there were actually two. They play the Trooper, the Klansman, and Run of the Hills. Then they go back in, and then they come back out with Churchill's Speech and Aces High with the Replica Spitfire. So two encores to give you that little bit of extra excitement because they know they trimmed the set down a little bit, but well worth it. An amazing closer, Aces High. Yeah, out of all the closers, it's really, really hard. Like I said, with my experience with my Made in England show, and the two shows I saw for the Final Frontier in North America when they played Running Free wasn't my favorite closer. The 2022 Legacy show with Ace of High as a closer was amazing. Run to the Hills as a closer on Legacy of the Beast 2019 when I saw them gave me the Rock and Rio vibes uh, because they played Sign of the Cross and Klansman and they played Wicker Man the first time around and they closed with Run of the Hills, and it just, it, when I saw that in 2019, them closing with that song, it just took me back to watching Rock and Rio, where Bruce says, This is a song you all want to hear, and you deserve to fucking hear it. Run to the hills, you know, and they play it. It just gave me that sensation of being at Rock and Rio, a modern day Rock and Rio mixed with peace of mind, and it was amazing. And then this latter show that I just saw, the most recent one, you know, a lot of it was more of the same, but I was just so grateful to see three new tracks from Senjutsu, because I love that record, and and they delivered, and, and they killed it again, they killed it again, and the thing that was great about this record was, and this tour, they had Senjutsu Eddie come out at the very beginning, Samurai Eddie, Walk On Eddie is Samurai Eddie, he came out during Senjutsu, and then they had Trooper Eddie come out during the Trooper. And they had the big, like I said, Devil Eddie 
come out. Demon Eddie in the background during Iron Maiden. So, just added even more to the production of the set. And they took out, you know, a couple songs from from uh, the previous Legacy set they had to fit in the Senjutsu stuff. But I think they did a really good job of making it fresh and new and mixing it up a little bit. Uh, you know, we didn't get Where Eagles Dare this time around. We didn't get For the Greater Good of God. We didn't get Two Minutes to Midnight or The Evil That Men Do. But we got all the new Senjutsu songs, Senjutsu, Stratego, and Writing on the Wall. And we got Blood Brothers that they added. And along with Phantom of the Opera, truly and honestly, I wish that would become a perennial staple in the set list too. Because I think it's such a powerful song and they should always play it. They should always play Blood Brothers. I love Fear of the Dark. It's great. The live version destroys the album version. Every live version of Fear of the Dark is amazing. I love it. But Phantom of the Opera is a better song and it should fit into the set list over that. Same thing with Blood Brothers. Those two, in my opinion, are just better songs. And um, I really, really think that they should be in the set list perennially forever. But that was kind of a quick recap of just my touring experience with the band. I saw them twice in 2008. I saw them twice in 2010. I saw them once in 2012. I saw them once in 2017. Twice in 2019. And now just recently once in 2022. They've already said, because Matt and I are from the States, that 2023 for the Future Pass Tour is only going to be in Europe. But they're going to carry it over to 2024, and I'm hoping they bring it to the States. You guys have been listening to the podcast. You know that Somewhere in Time is like my personal, I don't want to say it's my favorite, but it's the album two I relate the most Power Slave and Somewhere in Time from the 80s are just their albums that I, I love. They're probably, if I had to pick two, I can't, here's the thing, I can't pick, I can't just pick one. I have to pick those two. Power Slave and Somewhere in Time. I mean, I love those records. They are unbelievable. Um, and they're they're complete opposites of each other. And that's why I love them so much. But then I love all the reunion stuff too. I mean, I, I, love, I love it all. I love Iron Maiden. So... Yeah, but I'm I'm looking forward to them bringing the Future Pass tour over here in 2024. They've already promised that there's going to be some deep cuts from Senjutsu on there, so I'd really, really love to see The Parchment, Hell on Earth, Death of the Celts, you know, some of the stuff we haven't seen already. But more than likely, they're going to play... They're going to play Time Machine. They're going to play Days of Future Past, obviously, because they correlate with time, and it would segue perfectly with Somewhere in Time. From Somewhere in Time, I'd love to see Caught Somewhere in Time. Uh, I, Wasted Years is amazing every time. I mean, I've seen it several times, but I, I'd see it again. I love that song. Um, but outside of Wasted Years, Caught Somewhere in Time, Stranger in a Strange Land, Alexander the Great. I mean, those three from that record are the ones that I want to see the most. They are Amazing. Uh, I, I could see Heaven Can Wait Again, too. It's been since 2008 since I've seen that. Love to see that. I'd love to see Sea of Madness, too. But if I had to pick the three that I really want to see the most, Caught Somewhere in Time, Stranger in a Strange Land, and Alexander the Great. That would be phenomenal. And if they were really clever and pulled a little trickery and a surprise from the first album... Because this kind of relates to time, too. Man, I would love to see Remember Tomorrow live with Bruce. Oh, my God, that would be amazing. That is one song from the first record that I would love to see live that I have never seen. And uh, I think he would he would destroy it. I think they played it on the um, Eddie Rips Up the World tour in 2005 that focused on Iron Maiden, Killers, and Number of the Beast, the first three albums, and a little bit of peace of mind. But, man, that would be a phenomenal, phenomenal tour let's just I'm just going to spitball here if they do four from Senjutsu four from Somewhere in Time 
and then two that they dabble with. Oh my goodness, can you imagine this? We get to see Days of Future Past, we get to see Time Machine, we get to see Parchment, we get to see Hell on Earth. Amazing. Those four songs from Senjutsu. Then they play Caught Somewhere in Time, Wasted Years, Stranger in a Strange Land, Alexander the Great. We're up to eight songs, right? Then if they played like Remember Tomorrow and Phantom of the Opera, <laughs> that would be phenomenal. Hit me with Number of the Beast and Hallowed, right? We're up to 12. And then they got four songs to fill with whatever the hell they want. I would be satisfied just seeing those dozen. Just seeing those dozen, I my head would explode. I mean, like, and seeing the stage set and Cyborg Eddie and hopefully some cool Cyborg backdrops or a fusion like they did with the artwork of Samurai and Cyborg Eddie together, that would be cool. But I'm just, I cannot wait for that tour. It sucks that we have to wait till 2024. I was hoping Rob would be like, Yep, the end of 2023, because the summer's Europe, but uh, in the fall and winter, we're going to play in the States. And I was like, oh, man, yes, but no, we got to wait till 2024. But hopefully they won't make us wait too long. Hopefully it'll be March. March of 2024 would be sweet. That would be amazing. Um, and at that point in time, that would be a 16-year gap from the first time I saw me. <laughs> Hard to believe it or not. But I've been a fan for a long time. Uh, uh, going on 20 years now, it's hard to believe. I mean, it just flew by. But Iron Maiden is life. Iron Maiden is is my life. I mean, I live my life by Iron Maiden. My life in Maiden, a matter of life in Maiden. I'm sure Matt can relate. Matt feels the same way. This is why we decided to name the podcast that. And um, I hope everybody gets a chance to actually go out there and see Iron Maiden if you haven't yet. When they come to play the Future Past tour over here in the States, wherever you're seeing them, across the country, whatever part of the world you're from, whatever continent, I hope you get to go experience it, and I hope you get to just have that added to your life, because it is just, they are an amazing band, they're they're more than a band for me, I mean, they are a way of life, and everything that they do is amazing as far as I'm concerned. They care about their fans. They 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 care about the things that they do. They're very straightforward. They're a very liberal and caring band. And they sing about things that matter. They sing about history. They sing about science fiction. They sing about philosophy. Their music and them as people and their belief systems are just ways to make you better people if you give them the chance. They will teach you so much about life. They are the holy grail of music and truly the holy grail of a lot of things for me as a person. Uh, they motivate you to to go out there and pursue self-discovery and intelligence and life. And they give you the hope and the desire to be a better person and to, to reach and attain your goals. And the list goes on. They are just that powerful as a band and as a group and as people and their lyrics and their music and everything that they do is just cream of the crop, top of the line. You know, made in his life, the rest is history. So thanks everybody for listening to me ramble here about all this pent up love and joy I have for the band. But uh, I appreciate you tuning in to a matter of life and made in the podcast of the beast. I am Joe Labriola. I hope everybody has a great one out there. And hopefully Matt and I can get together and talk about our experiences together in the very near future. I look forward to that. Look forward to you guys listening. And as always, appreciate all the support. Take care of yourselves. Up the irons.